Negroes must sit in the back of the bus. That's what the signs said. Some of you were alive when those signs of racial segregation were posted in a number of American states. Throughout the South, African American people had to sit, by law, in the back of the bus. There were public restrooms which said, whites only, on the door. And at department stores, African Americans couldn't sit down at the lunch counter to have a club sandwich. They were the wrong color. In November of 1956, the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional for the public buses of Montgomery, Alabama to be racially segregated. And just a few weeks later, in December, Dr. Martin Luther King announced the end of a boycott of those bus lines. For the first time, African Americans would be able to get on the bus and sit in any available seat. Dr. King knew that those first African Americans who got onto those newly integrated buses could face resistance, anger, or even violence. He knew that the African American people stepping onto those buses could be walking into the heart of racial hatred. So Dr. King told African Americans that if they were walking into the darkness of racial hatred, they had one option, be the light. Dr. King typed a one-page set of instructions for the African-American people who were about to board those buses. Fortunately, a yellow, faded copy of that sheet of paper still exists. And this is what Dr. King told those people who were walking into a very difficult situation. Among other things, Dr. King instructed them, demonstrate calm dignity in all your actions. In all things, show forth courtesy and good behavior. Be loving enough to absorb evil. Be understanding enough to turn an enemy into a friend. If cursed, do not curse back. If struck, do not strike back. Pray for your oppressor and use spiritual force to carry on the struggle for justice. That's what Dr. King said, and that's what his followers did. Can you imagine? There actually have been times in America when we had leaders who called us to spiritual greatness. Now, the first time I read Dr. King's set of directives for those who would be boarding those buses, I kept saying to myself over and over again, he's asking them to do something very hard. After all, African American people had been oppressed and despised and beaten and even lynched. And in effect, Dr. King was saying to them, in response to all that evil, I want you to be calm and dignified loving and nonviolent, and your strength to, to do all of this will be rooted in prayer, in the Spirit. I thought of all this as I pondered today's Gospel passage, because in today's Gospel, Jesus is asking us to do something that's very hard. In a world that's full of so much darkness, Jesus says, you are the light of the world and you're not allowed to hide your light. I'm sending you into the world with all of its darkness, all of its evil, all of its temptation and harshness and its unjust situations. I'm sending you into that darkness, and I want you to be the light. Be the light so that people can see the good that you do and give glory to God. Dr. King told people that they needed to walk into those buses filled with the darkness of racial animosity so that they could be the light. And Jesus tells us that he's sending us to every place that's filled with the darkness of anger and fear and poverty and mistrust, and that it is our Christian calling 
to be the light. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Go be the salt. Go be the light. Go do what's right. Go do what's Christ-like in every situation. Now, when we were children, almost all of us learned a song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And at least when I was a kid, I loved that song. We all loved that song, and it sounded so easy. Christ gave me a light, and I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to let me shine. I'm going to let my light shine. But when I was a child, I didn't know what that would cost. When you're a child, you're not aware of some of the darkness that life brings our way and some of the difficult circumstances where we will have to work hard to bring God's light to what's so dark. When you're a child, you think it's easy to let your light shine. You think it's easy as a child, and then, then you become a teenager, and you're at a party where underage drinking is going on, and you know it's wrong, but there's so much pressure to just stay quiet and fit in. Well, that's darkness. But Jesus says, let your light shine. Then maybe you become a college student and you're on a campus where almost every social gathering centers on binge drinking and casual sex. And you know that's wrong. That's darkness. But how do I change an entire campus culture? And Jesus says, let your light shine. Then you get hired for a job, and very soon you realize that you are in a toxic work environment where good people are mistreated and injustice happens on an almost daily basis, and some of your co-workers make your stomach churn some days, and there's so much darkness there, and you just want to escape. And Jesus says, let your light shine. Then you look around at legal and social and economic policies which relegate some people to the unseen sidelines of despair and hopelessness. The hungry are still hungry and the homeless are still homeless and the afflicted are still afflicted. So much dark suffering. How can I change an, an entire economy? And Jesus says, let your light shine. We look in our families and, and we see so much illness and we experience the sudden death of loved ones and some people are gripped by fears concerning the marriage or your children or your future. Those are like storm clouds of darkness. And then we hear Christ's gospel command, let your light shine. Satan would like nothing more than for Christian people to throw up our hands in resignation as we lament that there's too much darkness in the world and we can't possibly make a difference. That would be easy, wouldn't it? 2016 felt awfully dark for so many people. Angry political divisions, war and violence, a terrorist attack in Nice, a priest killed while celebrating the Eucharist in France, another shooting at an American airport darkness. Satan would love it if we just threw up our hands and said, the darkness is, is too strong. It's too much. We can't possibly shine any light in our world. We could give up. But if we do that, then the darkness wins and the light gets lost. So Jesus calls us to that hard, difficult, daily vocation of being the light being the light in our family, even when it seems as if no one else cares, being the light on campus, even when it seems no one else believes, being the light at work, even when we wonder why God wants us to stay in a hard situation, being the light as citizens and neighbors, even when we wonder how we can possibly make a difference on behalf of the hungry and the homeless and the victim of injustice. That is our daily, difficult vocation in Christ. If you're looking for an easier spiritual guru, 
you'll have to search the internet. There are lots of them out there who will promise you everything and demand of you nothing. But if you want to change the world for the better, and if you want to demonstrate that there is an alternative to hatred and selfishness, if you want to show others that the gospel is the only way of life that makes ultimate sense, if you want to continue the transformative work that Jesus set in motion, then pick up your cross, dust yourself off, step onto the bus, walk into the darkness, and be the light of Christ. Death tried to lock that light in a tomb, but that first Easter morning was radiant with Christ's eternal light, and today can be radiant too. And perhaps that's the most important thing to learn and remember from this Gospel reading. Yes, it is true. In this passage of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus says to us, You are the light of the world. But in the eighth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Ultimately, none of this depends on us. It depends on Jesus. And ultimately, none of this comes from us. It comes from Jesus. And ultimately, none of this originates in us. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the light. Maybe the best way to understand our vocation as baptized believers is to think about the stained glass windows that we often see in churches. At the church where I grew up in Pennsylvania, there were three beautiful windows just above the altar and pulpit up front. On most Sunday mornings, when the sun was shining, those windows burst forth with brilliant color and exquisite light and detail. As the light came streaming through the, the glass, it became a rainbow of color that filled the whole space. But on those occasions when we attended a church service at night, those windows were, were dark. They looked like just a dark piece of the wall, and we couldn't see anything. Jesus is the light of the world. The light comes from him, and it is him. So today I think Jesus is asking us to allow his light to shine through us, like those windows behind the pulpit at my church growing up. Without Jesus, I really don't have any light to shine in this world. But if I stay in prayerful communion with Christ each day, then His light can shine through me and through you and through every person dedicated to the good news. As His light shines through us, it becomes a rainbow of detailed and diverse color, radiating the Lord's beauty in the places that need Him the most. In the end, I think, I'm not the light. Jesus is the light. But Christians humble enough to let Christ's light shine through us truly can become a light in the darkness. And we can walk on to any bus. We can walk into any situation shining with a divine light which overcomes every darkness.